This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. And uh, I will just briefly run over what we have coming up on today's show because in a little bit we're going to be joined by Terry Finley from West Point Thoroughbreds. Why? Because he is now a Kentucky Derby winning owner. So we wanted to get some thoughts from last week from Terry. If you saw the, the nice video, America's Best Racing put together, they followed him around all day, Kentucky Derby Day. That was intriguing. I still have it linked over uh, on Equidaily. Uh, we're going to have some discussion, uh, Preakness in just a minute, uh, new shooters and Derby horses, what we think there. We'll take a look at the Peter Pan. Uh, I said earlier on the handicapping report, handicappers report, uh, kind of trying to plug in divisions here on various weeks and looking at uh, some of the divisions. This week I picked up turf males Interesting thinking. Interesting one you chose yeah, right off think, the bat. I'm thinking like. that the man, uh, the, the man of war of eight, uh, or the, the, uh, you know, yesterday and last week might settle things a little bit, and I don't think they did uh, at Churchill, Churchill or Belmont. Um, We'll talk a little bit about the coverage of uh, the Kentucky Derby in mainstream uh, media. Dave Grenig from the Daily Racing Forum will join us. He'll give us a little update on those changes that are going to be made at Aqueduct, but also just a recap of uh, the uh, stakes action at Belmont yesterday. All of that coming up on uh, today's show. But I thought, as I say, we'd, we'd start out just taking a look at uh, next Saturday's Preakness uh, Derby horses as compared to... Uh, new shooters, and I pulled up a replay here, and I just wanted people to see because perhaps the most interesting new shooter to me is Royal Mo, um, and we're going to look at the Santa Anita Derby. The winner here is going to be number eight, Gormley. Number three, Battle of Midway runs second. Number thirteen is Royal Mo. He finishes third. Number one is Term of Art. He finishes seventh. He doesn't excite me in any fashion. But again, the number thirteen Royal Mo runs third, and I pulled this up because Battle of Midway ran so well in the Derby, running second here in the Santa Anita Derby. He follows that up with a good third in the Kentucky Derby. That's what made Royal Mo interesting. But the winner was Gormley. So I think you can, you can go either way coming out of this Santa Anita Derby. Either you have, hang your head on Battle of Midway and think, yeah, Royal Mall might be interesting, or you look at Gormley and you think, yeah, maybe not. Uh, as the West Coast bias guy, I thought Southern California was a one-horse town, and uh, that town left. Uh, I think Battle of Midway regressed a little bit to not win the Santa Anita Derby. I think he's the best of what's left. I think he's pretty... Average at this point in his career. Uh, I do know people that were hoping that Royal Mo, you know, would would make the Kentucky Derby. Uh, I'm uh, I am a big believer in, you know, uh, having prejudices for or against. Like I have a big one coming up for the Preakness right now. I'm sitting on the idea that inside was golden on a muddy day, and that the four and five path was really bad. Uh, I'm right now sitting on the idea, set that the Santa Anita Derby was a very poor prep race. I was glad to see such a full field, but I think when Mastery went down, that was really, you know, it goes, in, it goes not even in cycles. It just is really random that the West Coast has been really deep and strong, and it's not this year. So I, I'm against, and I gave Gorman a little shot with the off-going set. He had run well. I think he got like a 94 buyer speed figure in a two-turn route race in the mud, and he was awful. So I'm sitting on the idea that the Californians and the San Diego Derby horses are a reach for me. Battle Midway, notwithstanding, because I, I think he, he moved forward in the Derby and put out a big effort. Yeah, and as I say, I found him a little bit interesting, Royal Mo. if you were looking right, for a new shooter, but, yeah. but I, I find it hard to look for a new shooter. I no. mean, I just think historically it's the horses coming out of the Derby. Why? 
Derby horses are the best three-year-olds at yeah. that point in the year. The other ones just did, didn't you make it. You hardly skip the Derby with a really yeah. hot, in-form horse to go for the Belmont. Matter of fact, in my lifetime, I think Linkage might have been the only one, and that was over 30 years ago. So nobody does that, and you make a great point. The best would be there unless something very minor goes wrong, because if something goes wrong, it has to be minor because you're going to wheel back in two weeks. Cloud computing is going to attract some interest because it's Chad Brown. Castellano jumps off of Gunnavera to get on him, but he comes out of a well-beaten third in the, the Wood Memorial. He's only got three career races, so the win the, won the career debut, second in the Gotham, and then third, uh, beaten seven lengths by Iris Warcry. So, uh, again, I think because it's Chad Brown, Klerovich, Castellano, he'll take a little attention, but he, even he doesn't, uh, you know, get He does, too, but he, I'm going to give you a horse who Cloud Computing reminds me of. Painter. And what I mean by that was Painter always seemed to be reaching a bridge too far each time. That Bob Baffert kept going one rung on the ladder too high based on the calendar. A very talented horse, but just the timing didn't work out. Now, Cloud Computing broke the maiden in, if you're watching uh, the inner dirt track, it was just very impressive and then probably be set because of how impressive it was and Chad Brown probably liked the animal going in they're like well maybe it's even better than they thought maybe I can catch up rapidly and he went right into stakes company good stakes company and I think he has really good talent because his losses have been like, considering he's behind the curve, have been okay. But I think he's in the same spot once again. He's still behind the curve, like one race or two, and he keeps reaching higher than his, slightly higher than his resume gets in. But I think there's a lot of talent there, and I almost wished he would skip this spot. Yeah, yeah, because uh, then you're, yeah, yeah, when you have these horses that shoot a little over their head early and, and do it a couple of times. It's, mm. uh, senior investment comes out of the win in the Lexington. Uh, don't get too excited about him. Multiplier won the Illinois Derby with a good number. It's hard to, you know, it's hard to get past, I think, the, uh, the Derby runners. But again, we'll see how it sorts out. I will not be getting past going. the Derby runners. Yeah, and you're, what, you're classy, classic. Classic Empire, empire yeah. in a big way. And I think that, it's going to be interesting to see how the odds shake out. I don't think I don't think he'll leapfrog by any means. Always dreaming, but I'll be interested to see how close they they wind up getting. I don't think he's going to be five to one. Uh, all right, we will uh, take now a little look. Uh, we talked a little bit about it uh, last week, but I just wanted to go back and uh, just kind of recap Derby betting and and kind of just see hey what worked and what didn't potentially. And uh, let you that kind of maiden, line up maybe the for, maiden for was next faded year. Over, was favored over the Gotham one hundred and four yeah, buyer speed figure. We've talked about Patch, and we'll talk about Patch again a little bit later when we talk about some of the the media and how that played out. Patch at fourteen to one was just kind of crazy. Um, and I talked to Joe Christofek, uh from Churchill Downs on Friday, and he put it together. Uh, hats off to him. And, and you got to think a little bit outside the box. We always say take the rubber band off the yes. off the bankroll. But he put together a bet you will appreciate because you've got that trifecta uh, pyramid. Tr pyramid. Yes. And he had more of a trifecta, I would say, kind of statue. Because uh, he, he, his next two underneath were the same. But he had a 2 by 14 by 14. And I think it was McCracken. It was always dreaming because he hit it. It was always dreaming. And I think he said McCracken on top. And then he went 14 by 14. 50 cent bet, he, I think he said it cost him about 150, but he got $4,000 back. So uh, uh, that was uh, uh, an intriguing play. He was a little bit bold on top, spread the way you uh, like to do, yeah. but as I say, it was a little bit different. It wasn't quite a pyramid, but he went very deep underneath yeah. with a ticket that was see, you he, know, expensive, but reasonable given that it was the Derby and came back with a great payoff. See, he takes probably the other school of thought with the thing. What he's basically saying is, the second place pick is the key really to him, which is why he wants 14, where I'm, I would be a three by eight by like 14. That's really a different angle. He's really wanting to, to get that second place in there, and he's willing to say, and I, I would ask Joe publicly, that why you just don't buy the all underneath because when you pay it out, this is a unique betting day, etc. But 
it's a unique bet betting day. The Derby is a unique betting race because the opportunity to make a score. And that's why when I say to people, it's probably the only race a year, including the Breeders' Cup. Because remember, the Breeders' Cup have 14 horse fields maximum. But you can put three horses on top and then spread and spread. You have to, you know, you save for it for the year. But I always say this, Seth. The idea here is I'm supposed to go down in flames if the horses I toss out as having any chance of winning, always dreaming, and my horse, Nehru, a couple years ago, looking at Lee. The idea is if you handicap the race well, you put yourself in financial pit position to make a score. That's what Joe Chris Effect did. He liked always dreaming, and he found a way to make it work in boxcar numbers by having a bankroll applicable to that day. For me, you lose $356 because my opinion at the end of the day stunk. Because I, I mean, people were like, oh, you had a 33 to one shot run second. I go, yeah, but a horse that I tossed won the race. I'm not supposed to cash anything, and I didn't. And that's justice, as it is justice for Joe to say, I like a horse, and I found a way to make $150 pay off $4,000. Yeah, and as I say, when he said that, we were talking during the break, and when we went on the air, I said, tell the folks what, what you played. I thought it was uh, it was kind of a bold move. Who was the second one, McCracken? I was think McCracken it was McCracken. Always McCracken. I think it was McCracken. Great uh, job. Um, but, yeah, put together a nice play. Uh, some of the other uh, ideas to keep uh, in mind going ahead. Uh, the pick three over the two days, the Oak, Woodford, and the Derby. That was 175 for two. But Brian Nadeau at the seminars we did, he touted, and Jeremy Plonk talked a little bit about it last week, the Oaks Derby double. Did you think that was a good price in. for that pick three? Well, uh, what a, the, Abel the comparison, 175 for the pick three, but the Oaks Derby double was 146. Yeah, bet one so, more race, win less money. Yeah. So yeah. The, 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 Love and, those and, blind bets. And Brian... Uh, talked about that and as I say Jeremy mentioned it too you know and Abel Tasman wasn't uh, a stretch by any uh, um, imagination there and you had the favorite in the, in the derby you wound up with a 146 and if you had Abel Tasman going into always dreaming you can now sit on the sidelines as far as your win bet and use that money to play around a little more so again next year maybe think about that you know you had to have Abel Tasman granted but as I say that wasn't uh, much of a stretch and on the the uh, future pools I jumped into the January pool, came up with $7 for uh, Always Dreaming. On Derby Day, he pays 11 but keep in mind, I had Always Dreaming and 11 other horses for the $7, which I didn't make a ton of money, but it took a little bit of the sting out of the day. And so I've said before, the all others, pool two and pool three, I wound up with, I think, because I also had Gunnavera on an individual bet, I think I had 14 of the horses in the starting gate in some fashion. And as I say, it didn't, it, I didn't make a ton of money with the $7, but it took a little bit of this thing out. So keep the future pool in mind as well. All right, we'll head to a break. When we come back, Terry Finley, West Point Thoroughbreds. He was in the winner's circle just a week ago. Churchill Downs, Kentucky Derby. We'll talk about that experience right after this. You're watching, and they're off on the OTV TV Network. You know, it's not easy being your friend. Hey, race fans, head down to the all new Clubhouse Racebook. With live horse racing on more than 250 flat screen TVs, state of the art wagering terminals, and amazing Vegas style atmosphere, the Clubhouse Racebook, 7 Eleven Central Avenue, Albany. No matter where in the world you are, the excitement of wagering on horse racing is just a click away. CapitalOTV.com offers live streaming, past performances, race replays, our virtual tote board, analysis and selections from professional handicappers, and a simple, safe, and secure wagering platform. And best of all, you get track prices. Going on now, it's Bet50, Get50. Simply open a Capital Bets account, bet $50, and get $50 cash back. CapitalOTV.com. Log on today. And they're turning for home. Cold Town and Citation head and head. And it looks like Eddie Arkell has got his dirty. They're coming in there just like they were the enemy, riding each other close. And it is Citation coming to the front. He's everything the said he was. He's going to win with his ears pricking. It is Citation by two. There's a strong left-handed whip again by Tinkai. He goes to it time and time again. But Ronnie Turcott has his whip put away. And Secretariat has him put away. He's been getting the draw away. It is Secretariat. Driving, affirmed in Alidar, headed.
steps apart. Affirm's got a nose in front as they come on to the wire. At the finish, it's going to be dead tight. Affirm's got a nose in front. front as they come to the wire, an American pharaoh and Victor Espinosa have won the Preakness over Taylor Verb. Bob Baffert get yet another chance at a triple crown. Championship horse racing continues at Capital OTB. There's no better place to watch, wager, and win than OTB TV and CapitalOTBBet.com. Welcome back to And They're Off on this Sunday morning, a week after the Kentucky Derby, and happy to be joined now by Kentucky Derby winning owner, part of the team behind Always Dreaming, Terry Finley, president of West Point Thoroughbreds. Good morning, Terry. Hey, you guys. Always a pleasure to be with you, especially on a beautiful Sunday morning. Yeah, we're, we're happy to talk to you uh, because I'll tell you, Terry, uh, I tweeted or I texted you right after the race. I said, Kentucky Derby winning owner has a pretty nice ring to it. But uh, I was kind of living vicariously through you, you, you guys because now I'm a friend to a Kentucky Derby winning owner. I know you. <laughs> I know Tommy Bellhouse. It was fun to, to root for you guys on Derby Day. It was a lot of fun to watch the, uh, the video ABR put out that followed you around all day. And we'll talk a little bit about that specifically and the specific day. We'll get to that in a minute. But just talk about eight days out, uh, having a little time to reflect now. And are you still walking on air? Uh, yeah, well, well, let me tell you, I appreciate our friendship with you guys, with OTB. You guys do great work. You really do, and I just don't say that just because I'm on on the show with you guys. You've been friends with us, and you know, from when I started back in the early '90s, so I, I, you know, you remember the friends and the people who who were nice to you, you know, before things fell into place and you got lucky. So I appreciate that. And no, it, it, I have not come down off there, but I, I will tell you. I said today, I just I had breakfast with my family, and we celebrated our mothers. And uh, it, it's a tiring week, I can tell you, because hmm. the adrenaline rush yeah. for the first, like, 48 hours is, is over, off the charts, over the top. And then you just, you know, you're on empty, and you're trying to catch up, but you're, you're doing a lot of different things. But I can tell you, I'm not complaining. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just stating facts. Now, Terry, have you started work on redesigning the business card? <laughs> That's right. No, I haven't. But you know what? I hadn't even thought about that. Okay. Anthony, but you know what? I don't know. It's 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 a humbling experience. And you know, you, 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 look, we're a public company. We sell partnerships, right? There's no yes. doubt. But but you have to you have to be careful. Like you, that can't be the the you know the the number one. Because you know, quite frankly, as I said to somebody fairly quickly after the derby, the people who who are who stick with us and who are going to join us in the future. Yeah, it's cool to be associated with the Derby for all of us and, and a winning effort in the Derby. But, but also, they, they, they like that, but they don't care. They, they want horses th that they own that are going to be successful, and, and that's really going to be our leadership challenge is to make sure, and we won't. We won't take our eye off the ball of you know, continuing to try to do every day the things that we need to do to make sure our horses and our partners are successful. Before we get to the race itself and have you take us through it, talk a little bit about how you jumped on and became part of the, the group behind Always Dreaming, because you did it uh, just before he won the uh, Florida Derby. And I know you had something that weekend. We were down doing television, but Tommy Bellhouse was down there, and he was in the winner's circle afterwards representing you guys. So it was great timing. You jumped on board right before the Florida Derby and then into the Kentucky Derby. Talk about how you became part of the partnership. I will, Seth. So... We, um, we went uh, uh, to West Point for our company meeting in December, and we came out of there saying, you know, we need to do, do more in the, in the uh, uh, you know, horses off the, racing, off the racetrack. And so we bought a horse in Europe at the, in the first quarter. We bought a horse for the Pegasus in the first quarter. And right at the beginning of the, of the well, actually, in the, the end of the third quarter, we bought into Always Dreaming, and it was just a matter of being at the right place at the right time. You know, I'm, I'm good friends with... Uh, uh, Vinny Viola and the Bonomos are, are, are friends that we met actually in the box section at Saratoga. And we just, we've always felt like uh, it would be for the right horse at the right time, it'd be a, a good partnership. And, 
you know, obviously always dreaming was the right horse at the right time. So we just got together. You know, they gave us a price that was absolutely you know, borderline insulting. And you know, my partner, he, he came in, you know, Sienna Farms, and, and they, uh, they said, you know, hit the bid. And we were, we were in a position where we were you know, lucky enough to take a, a minority stake of always dreaming. And um, now that, that price that was in at the end of March that was you know, borderline obnoxious is a big <laughs> discount. So, <laughs> you know, most of the time that doesn't work out. We know that. But every once in a while, you, you, it, it, you're in a position where you're made to look smart because you look dumb a lot in, in, this, in this game. And we've... We're, we're guilty of that on a regular basis. But, you know, you, you just got to keep throwing leather, as I tell people, and every once in a while something really, really good is going to happen to you. All right, take us through it. We'll, we'll, we'll have them coming out of the gate here. And, again, in that ABR video, you guys are kind of standing down on the apron, and as they go by you the first time, you look kind of calm. And, and certainly there's a lot of race left, and you're in a great position, obviously, going by you guys the first time. But take us through the race because he's in a good position all the way around. And again, that ABR video, by the time they come by the second time, it's a little, there's a little more excitement in your group. As they come by us now, uh, the first time down the stretch, again, take us around the track as you watch the race. Yep. I, I was concerned all week that we would be a little keen, and, and that was the biggest concern I had. We, we would be keen the first part of it because you know you can't win the Kentucky Derby if you're keen all the way around because you're just not. <sighs> You know, unless you're a secretary, when you get to the quarter pole, the horses behind you that have been in good rhythm and have gotten their air and have, have, have got good trips are going to come running at you. So when he went by us the first time, I saw Johnny. You know, I saw, I saw Always Dream had come back to him, you know, the right way and very quickly. And when, it, when I saw that, when I saw Johnny very comfortable and very confident and I saw our horse in, in you know, great rhythm, I said, they're going to have a tough time beating this horse today. Now, of course, we're biased, but that's what I said, and, and they called me on video, and I just took a swig of water, and I just enjoyed the next half mile. And then we're, they're approaching, uh, approaching the far turn now as we're watching the replay, and he's just going up and edging into the lead here. Take us through as they go around the, uh, the far turn and into the stretch, and as he holds off the other horses. And again, watching that ABR video, your emotion level is understandably going up. What's the feeling like as they come into the stretch, you're in the lead, and then you start to realize, oh, we're going to win. Jeff, you know, I wish that I had the words to kind of articulate that a little bit better, but it, it was truly special. And, and I, when I, you know, the good thing is with the big board at Churchill, you can see things starting to develop. And when I saw Johnny kind of, you know, push the button at the, into the far turn and he, he went by the leader, I, I just said, all right, either he's trying to, trying to take it to them and, and steal the race, or he's got so much horse that, you know, we, we just won the Kentucky Derby. Now this is the far turn. When they turned for home, I, I heard, you know, I, I saw Classic Empire, and I, I knew um, the Kraken was going to become, you know, come running, and they were on the outside. But when our Colt, when he he changed leads, I mean, he surges like very few other horses in the in in the industry right now. And and he just, you know, he went from probably a length in front to three in front. And you know, I knew they were coming. But when he did that, it's like kind of a wide receiver in the NFL and. You know, running a good route and then and putting on the afterburners and you know they don't catch them with defensive back is scrambling to try to keep up with that that wide receiver. Well, that's what they were doing. They were trying to keep up with with a very fast uh, wide receiver and they went by us and I you know I was just like you know Johnny V, you're my hero. That's um, <laughs> that's what I said and uh, it was it was a beautiful. My family was there and. Uh, it was a beautiful last, like, 24 seconds, the last quarter of a mile. Uh, Terry, uh, as a winner, winning owner of the Kentucky Derby, I think it's one of the most understated trophies in the game. Uh, that, that last thought as it's being handed to you and you get to touch it as a winning owner, your thoughts were? Yeah, no, I remember. I remember one of the big things, Anthony, if you ever wanted time to stand still, 
Yes. Um, you know, I looked out at the crowd and, and, and just, you know, knowing that for 143 years, people have stood up here and accepted the Kentucky Derby winning owner trainer or uh, trophy. And you're right. It's an understated trophy and it's a beautiful thing. It's not very heavy, but it feels good. And, uh, I just was so humbled and so proud. And, you know, you think about a lot of different things very quickly up there and, you know, it's, it's a moment that I will never forget. And, and you want to talk about a family moment and a Kodak moment. Uh, you know, that was really at the top of our list because my, you know, my son-in-law, Daniel, uh, my daughter, my son, my wife, you know, we were all together. And uh, it was, you know, one of those moments that will, uh, will last a lifetime. And we just watched a couple of clips from uh, the ABR video, and, uh, and there may be a, a few more uh, seconds of you actually watching the race. Uh, again, I still have it linked over on Equidaily, and I, I advise people to watch it. it. It's fun. It takes you kind of through the whole afternoon right up to uh, that point on the, the stand holding up the trophy. Uh, just talk a little bit about have you seen the video, and did it capture the excitement? Yes, I have seen the video. And, you know, it, it's really good. I, I, I can tell you, uh, you know, if somebody follows you around all day and, you you know, they eat with you, they eat lunch with you, and they're, you know that they're working hard. They're, they they have their craft and they've honed their craft. And one of the things that, you know, he he made comment to me afterwards, he said, when you when the last quarter of a mile you guys were crying, you know, I was crying. And so th that, that was one of the coolest things. He said, I could barely, you know, keep the camera up uh, – so when you remember those types of things, and, and he had a special day too, and we had just met. So, you know, the, it, the Kentucky Derby and winning the Kentucky Derby, it impacts a lot of lives. And, you know, I, I, I'll just, I'll never take that for granted. And I, I know that there's a responsibility, you know, to, to represent all this, all these things that were, are good in our lives and in our racing lives. And I, I can, I can assure anybody that I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to uphold the, you know, the privilege and the tradition of you know, being you know, labeled a Kentucky Derby winning owner. Talk a little bit about, obviously, now less than a week away from uh, leg number two, the Preakness. Talk a little bit about when you head down and what the buzz is. It looks like Todd not planning any official workout, obviously, with a race, uh, you know, these, uh, just the two-week gap. But uh, what is the buzz over the last few days uh, on his arrival at Pimlico? And uh, as I say, when are you going to head down? Yeah, so we're headed back to Saratoga now. Um, okay. and we'll we'll take a day and we'll try to you know, get uh, rested up. But um, we'll be back down on Tuesday morning. I actually had a chance to spend some time with Todd about yesterday morning um, uh, at the track, and we uh, I didn't get a shot to see him train. He trained about five twenty. I thought he was going to train a little bit later, but it was raining. And Todd's got a quiet confidence. You know, he's not a boastful guy. He's not arrogant, but I know he feels he feels very good about this Colt. The Colt's given us all the right signals, and I know it's cliche, but um, I hope he's not lying to us because you know sometimes they 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 have a clunker in them and and they they tell you otherwise. And but I I think if we run our race and we don't you know we we work out a fairly clean trip, they're going to have a tough time beating us and. Um, you know, if they do, it'll be a very good three weeks for New York racing because <laughs> we're all New Yorkers, and the two main principals um, are from Brooklyn. And I think that the you, you know the population of Brooklyn that afternoon of the Belmont Stakes, if we're going for the Triple Crown, will be about eight people because everybody <laughs> else will be in Elmont, New York, you know, watching you know, what we hope to be history made. Yeah, it uh, again with the New York connections, that, that will be a very special Belmont. So betting uh, for you or not, I think there's a lot of people rooting for Always Dreaming. Before we let you go, Terry, do want to catch up with one of our favorites, Twilight Eclipse, oh, scratched okay. yesterday. But what's, uh, what's on the game plan next? Yeah, there's a mile and a half stake at Churchill Downs on Saturday. So we'll, we'll, uh, we diverted him. We know he doesn't run well on the soft turf. And, you know, the European Philly ran, uh, you know, lights out yesterday. So I think it was, it turned, everything turned out right. And that was a fortuitous uh, turn of events, as we say. And um, I, we weren't beating her. Um, that, that, that was a, a really stellar performance. So we'll, we'll probably be pretty strong favorite in that, uh, that stake on Saturday at Churchill. So we're, we're excited to you know, 
get a shot to get the old pro back in the winner's circle. Yeah, he's fun to root for. And on the other side of the equation, the old, old pro versus the, the youngsters. I uh, had Tommy on, Tommy Bellhouse, earlier this year during uh, uh, auction season. Talk a little bit about uh, West Point Thoroughbreds going forward, some of the two-year-olds that, that we may be looking forward to as the year progresses. Yep. I, you know, we, our two-year-old class depth is about 30 strong. Nice. Um, uh, you know, about 10 or so that we bought the yearling sales. We actually bought some, you know, in, in partnership with the Violas. So we'll, we'll continue to work on that relationship and, and try to buy good horses. So, um, and then we bought uh, probably 16 or 18 at the, at the two-year-old sales. We still got one or two left, um, you know, two-year-old sales. So it's, it's good. It's people really are, are, uh, um, are looking to come into our business and I, I couldn't be more proud and, I am proud of the of the industry, and and I tell people, we don't have to take a back a back seat to anybody because we have a great industry, and we got the best sport in the world, and we just got to continue to do a better job every day to promote and to expose our industry to more and more people, and we're headed in the right direction. I really believe that. Uh Terry, uh, I will tell people to uh, visit your website for more information, westpointtb.com. And, and really, one of the, it's one of the better websites uh, for partnerships because it's easy to follow. You have a nice news section, and, uh, a racing section. It's easy to follow the results and the entries and catch up with the latest news. Again, westpointtb.com. Or go to Google and type in West Point Thoroughbreds. It'll take Can't you to the website them. if people want uh, more information. But, Terry, got to uh, wrap up. But, boy... It was a lot of fun, as I say. We were able to live vicariously a little bit through the local guys up on the uh, victory stand after the Kentucky Derby, and we are clearly wishing you a lot of good luck this coming Saturday. Yeah, I think it'll be a fun trip. I, win, lose, or draw, but, but we certainly hope that we get the job done down there and we can try to make history uh, in early June uh, as the sun sets on June 10th at Belmont Park. But we do have a big assignment uh, on Saturday, and, and that's our focus, and um, we're – we're really blessed to be in the in the position we're in, and we're we're going to take every day and every hour and every moment, uh, and we're going to savor it. So we're thankful. Terry, appreciate the visit. Good luck. Take right, care, Terry. You See you soon. Terry Finley, president of West Point Thoroughbreds, again part of the uh, partnership owning owning uh, Always Dreaming, winner of the Kentucky Derby. Why don't we head to a break, and we'll we'll just roll the Peter Pan conversation we had planned into our conversation with Dave Grenick. So we'll take a break now. When we come back, uh, we'll talk a little turf males. We'll talk a little media coverage of the Derby and the Triple Crown. All of that right after this. <laughs> You're watching, and they're off, on the OTB TV network. You've got to be kidding me. The championship horse racing continues at Capital OTB. There's no better place to watch, wager, and win than OTB TV and CapitalOTBBet.com. sales reports on my desk by Monday. Whoops. 
My bad. Love racing? RTN brings you every live simulcast on your home television, plus live video streaming and race replays on your PC and mobile devices. To order, visit RTN.TV. RTN, a breed apart. Like to play Aqueduct or Belmont Park, but you live upstate? With Capital OTB, your favorite tracks are closer than you think. With more than 60 easy bed and branch locations throughout the region, you're just a short drive from all the top tracks across the country and around the world. For a complete list of all easy bed and branch locations, visit CapitalOTB.com. Welcome back to And They're Off. Seth Merrill and Anthony Mormino, as noted earlier, every few weeks or so, every couple of weeks maybe, plug in. Uh, just a look at the various divisions, and, and I thought, you know, with the, the uh, Woodford Reserve last week and, and uh, you know, the race in New York coming up uh, this week, maybe uh, things will shake out in that turf division. Not so much. Uh, I think it's totally up in the air, and I pulled together a couple of replays to look at. The first replay I wanted to look at was Divisadero last week down at Churchill Downs. Um, in the Woodford Reserve. Divisodero is going to be the number two horse. Running uh, second is number eight, Beach Patrol. I think he's a contender in this division. Uh, but then running, uh, what, fifth and sixth, Bala Bally and Enterprising coming off the good turf season at Fairgrounds also would be a contender in the division, but they finished fifth and sixth in here. And Divisodero is more a horse for a course kind of a performance. He's got to hold on to next year's yeah, Breeders' Cup. So it's just, it's tough to to make a case for any of these horses. The Visadero wins uh, 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 Beach, Beach Patrol, Patrol second, the favorite, but the right? other Beach two. Beach Patrol was the chalk. Yeah, Beach Patrol three to three to one, but uh, it, so it's hard to get excited about anybody two. out of that one is right. putting them at the top of the division. A couple things the way I see it. The American Patriot won the Makers 46 mile, the grade one at Keeneland. The Visadero has won the American turf Two years ago, the Woodford Reserve last year, he repeats this year winning. Uh, Seth said he's a, a horse for the course. Uh, they're going to try and keep him in training to the 2018 Breeders' Cup at Churchill Downs. Uh, I, I think that I'm not afraid of American Patriot going a mile on the turf. And I wouldn't be afraid, afraid of taking on DeVisadero folks, anywhere. Folks, you showed a Maker's Mile where American uh, Patriot does win the number three and horse because I had that in as In California, a they had the inclement weather throughout the year. And that series isn't what it used to be, which used to be an awesome wintertime, springtime series. Uh, we might have to go down to South Florida. But this is the Maker's 46 Mile Friday, right? It is right? American Patriot. It was a uh, Friday, I believe it was. And American Patriot, who... Folks, uh, I, I, I know you won in your cash. It's like it's the old uh, mind that bird. You still didn't get enough. He should have been, what was he, 10 to 1 with Castellano? Yeah. He, he deserved 20 to 1 uh, on that field. I think it was a well-balanced field, etc. I talk about it all the time. I know they say it's a grade one. Move on. Maybe you can use it uh, to your advantage betting later. But my point is, so far in Kentucky, the two grade ones that they've run – which are the middle distance turf, in my opinions, I would not be afraid of betting against either one of the winners. Yeah, an American Patriot, now a four-year-old, Beach Patrol, now a four-year-old. And I've said it before, a division I really like, a subdivision is three-year-olds on the turf. I didn't think it was that strong last year, but that's where you look for is, uh, older horses in the various divisions. And so Beach Patrol, he won the Secretariat last year. It still might not uh, be that strong. Ran second in the Hollywood Derby behind Annals of Time. Uh, Annals of Time hasn't been seen since then. Isotherm won the San Marcos earlier this year, and then they tried him in the Santa Anita Handicap. So uh, if they go get He's, back to the tur turf and Isotherm does well, some of the three-year-olds may step up, and as we get further into the summer, maybe they'll get interesting in this division. So you know, I can let you know ahead of time, it is May. I will bet it, be betting the Euros at Del Mar. <laughs> well, and, and again, it, I was going to say... Which, who, by the way, they should not fancy that turf course based on how small it is. Uh, I, but, and, and, you know, who who do you put on the top of the division right now? Uh, luckily, it is an eclipse time. I'm going to... Because I would have tough... Yeah. I it, mean, he, he... And I've said this before, and, and, and this is where... And he won the Gulfstream Park right. Turf Handicap, but that was, you know, one win and two starts this year. Uh, he's one win and four starts over the last two seasons. And I love the stallion, so that's where I get biased going for. I, I think he's uh, undervalued as one of the great world sires. He's no Galileo, certainly not in PR. But uh, I tell you, sometimes it's uh, – I can't see coming out of the fairgrounds 
you know, nothing in Southern California and so far the, the Kentucky and we've just commenced in New York. So that really leaves uh, South Florida and the Euros for me. And it's really a couple divisions. You have the marathoners and you have the middle distance uh, ones. And uh, I pulled up uh, uh, Watchmaker's Watch, the, uh, the Daily Racing Forum, Mike Watchmaker. Um, you know, he, a lot does of mediocrity he does the there. various divisions. He had Almanar on top, Beach Patrol, Divisadero, and American Patriot, the horses we talked about. Battle Annals of, of Time 7. Yeah, and it's just, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just really tough to, to put your finger on. Again, it's early in the year, and I thought that we're getting to the point in the year with it last week down at Churchill and this week in New York, maybe they would get some definition. I don't think we did. We got the horse for the course, and then we got the bad track condition yeah. yesterday that, yeah. that I don't think proved anything. All right, let's uh, get it on to it. proved how good that mare was. Couple, yeah. <laughs> That's what that showed. A couple uh, uh, minutes to uh, talk a little bit about the mainstream derby coverage, and, and the guys can kind of pop it up as we uh, talk here, because I pulled up three front pages, and really the derby is a special animal. I did it for Equidalia just to check out. There were front pages all around the country that had some, some uh, uh, Kentucky Derby coverage, notably the New York Times. A nice picture there right on the front page. Uh, the New York Post had a nice front page. A Milwaukee paper, I wanted to pull one out from the middle of the country, but at Milwaukee, Wisconsin uh, covers the Derby. So the Derby's kind of a funny animal. The, the ratings were very good. But then I'll throw in the New York Post, great picture on the front cover. The, the entire back cover of the New York Post was the, uh, the, the race. But if you open inside, a nice two-page spread. Both AP stories. Sure. Because there's nobody. <laughs> nobody. Can. Yeah, there's nobody. I've always said with all the people that get these credentials, at the, where do you go to then apply your job? Where does your work actually seep in? You show up and I'm like, I follow. And I'm question. sure that's true of, 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 of many, many of the other head, uh, front pages I saw. If you opened up, there was the AP story. I told was you in this there. story about two, three years ago where after a, a big race, uh, I've stopped doing it as a matter of fact. I bought the local papers, the Gazette, and they ran, and, and that just stopped. They all ran the same, they picked up the same story, and I'm like, that's it. I'm done. That's, they have no and it, and it's coverage, a, It's a really. function of the internet changing the way newspaper coverage is, and there's, there's good and bad. Uh, we can now go and... A lot of this stuff I don't need because they would go and cover the post-race press conference. I can find that on the internet now. I can watch it. But I'm a horse racing fan. You still want this mainstream coverage to spread, to evangelize the sport a little bit. I, I go back to that, and you'll remember what it was. I don't remember. Last four or five years, there was that golf tournament that was in prime time because it was out in Southern California. The U.S. Open, when they play the and, U.S. Open in, in and California. And it, it was nice. It was it bang, goes bang. To it was good, at night. And, I, and I watched it because it was in prime time. And it sucked me in for another couple of months because I was looking to see what the guys who did well. The Kentucky Derby is going to be run at night. And, and the Kentucky Derby plays similarly, and as a reference alluded earlier we saw that through patch that's why patch was 14 to 1 that horse was getting mainstream coverage folks tell me he was covered on the morning shows a couple of times he had stories in the newspaper we and need I, more I of that it, money in the pool yeah and a lot of those people one. were were kind of drawn in to, to follow the one-eyed horse story that's what mainstream coverage does and so as horse racing fans we can kind of say eh, i don't miss it that much because i can go on the internet and find what i want but, but it's almost the last free advertising. of newspapers so is the Sunday it. papers. I'm going to get them today, and after Denise falls asleep, I'm going to find out how much horse racing over four pages of Sunday sports race horse Sunday yeah, papers. Yeah, and an average are. weekend like this, it's nothing. Not be much. And yeah. that's how you have to get the word out. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we'll head to a break. When we come back, our friend Dave Grenig, Daily Racing Forum. We'll talk uh, New York racing in general, and we'll also talk about those stakes yesterday, including the Peter Pan. Stay tuned. You're watching, and they're off on the OTV TV network. One of these days, I am really going to let you teach that guy a lesson. Hey, race fans, head down to the all new Clubhouse Racebook. With live horse racing on more than 250 flat screen TVs, state of the art wagering terminals, and amazing Vegas style atmosphere, the Clubhouse Racebook, 7 Eleven Central Avenue, Albany. The championship horse racing continues at Capital OTB.
there's no better place to watch, wager, and win than OTB TV and Capital OTB Bet.com. And they're turning for home. Howl Town and Citation head and head. And it looks like Eddie Arkell has got his dirty. They're coming in there just like they were the enemy, riding each other close. And it is Citation coming to the front. He's everything the said he was. He's going to win with his ears pricking. It is Citation by two. There's a strong left-handed whip again by Tinkai. He goes to it time and time again. But Ronnie Turcott has his whip put away. And Secretariat has him put away. He's beginning to draw away. It is Secretariat. driving, affirmed and Alidar, heads apart, affirmed, got a nose in front as they come on to the wire, at the finish of point, he's dead tight, affirmed, in front as they come to the wire, and American Pharaoh and Victor Espinosa have won the Preakness over Taylor Bird. Bob Baffert get yet another chance at a triple crown. Equestricon. Equestricon. The first ever international racing convention. The first ever. For the fans. Meet the legends. The breeders, the owners. The jockeys like me. The best of the industry. Come celebrate racing at EquestraCon. Welcome back to, to And They're Off. Seth Merrill, Anthony Mormino in the studio, live via phone. Dave Grenning from the Daily Racing Forum. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, gentlemen. We were talking a little Preakness earlier, and we talked about the new shooters, and Royal Mo was one of the horses we talked a little bit about. But there has been an update. Why don't you give us that information? Yeah, unfortunately, he suffered a career-ending uh, injury this morning working out at Pimlico. He fractured the uh, sesamoid bone, one of the sesamoid bones in his right foreleg. Uh, during the workout, uh, Gary Stevens did a remarkable job in what I'm told about uh, pulling the horse up and then getting the weight off of his right leg. They got him back to the barn, x-rayed it, found the injury. He's actually, as we speak, on his way to New Bolt Center, which is where they took Barbaro 11 years ago. Uh, they don't know if he'll have to be operated on or not, but they're going to be monitoring his, uh, his uh, progress when he gets there. Uh, his career is definitely over, but his uh, life should be spared. It. But uh, and obviously, he's uh, not going to run his freedom. Yeah, unfortunate. Uh, let's also just check in momentarily, because I know you had a report on the uh, workout from Cloud Computing. Give us an update on uh, how he's going into the Preakness. Yeah, he had a pretty nice work yesterday. I know he had a fast work on Derby Day. I wasn't here for that, but I was told that it was pretty fast. Uh, so he had a little bit of an easier breeze, but he came home pretty nice yesterday. He beat the beat the clock, so to speak. It was raining, but it wasn't the heavy rain that we saw all day long. Uh, he went out around 5.30 on the training track, a half mile 48 two on my watch. I think they gave him 48-4 officially. He will van down to Pimlico on Tuesday and uh, gallop Wednesday, Thursday, Friday up to, up to the race. Um, you know, he's, he's, a live show. he's a live chance in there. I don't know that he can beat Always Dreaming, but uh, you know, playing those exotics, I, I could see him getting in the top four. Dave, a quick question about Clackman. Has Chad Brown uh, been high on this horse even before his first start? He was. Uh, you know, the horse actually trained in Saratoga last summer. You know, he had five workouts in the month of June, but then after his gate work on June 30th, they, uh, they had a, uh, a little small chip uh, in an ankle that they needed to take out. They took it out. Uh, he was one initially started in Florida, but he had so many maidens down there that he was sort of waiting, you know, picking and choosing which ones he felt should stay down there, which ones he felt should come up here. And what he told me the other day was he wasn't handling the heat as well as some of the other ones, so he figured, let's get him to New York and we can start him up there. So he's, he's, the horse he has been high on, um, I don't know if it's as high on as it was timeline, but uh, the horse has definitely showed himself to be a, a distant horse, and we'll see how he goes going forward. Well, speaking of timeline, let's jump in and kind of recap yesterday's stakes. Before we talk about them specifically, just give us a, a little feel for the weather, obviously, looking <laughs> through the TV screen. It looked bad, and uh, was it as bad live as it looked through the TV screen? One of the most, uh, one of the top ten most miserable days I've spent at a race. <laughs> All that uh, just, it's just awful. I mean, it was, you know, especially for May 13th, was it? It, it was cold, yes. rainy, raw. 
just, you know, it, it sort of almost reminded me of New York Showcase Day last fall, but probably two times worse. And it was just a shame for, you know, maybe their third biggest card of the yeah. week that, uh, that that happened. Because actually <laughs> today it happens to be beautiful. And, uh, you know, unfortunately they're off the grass today because of yesterday's rain. But uh, it, it was just, it was ugly. It was ugly. And uh, speaking of timeline, let's take a look at the Peter Pan Grade 3 event, mile and an eighth, one turn down there at Belmont. The uh, 45 cent to the dollar favorite, number two timeline, will get it done. Meantime, the three horse runs second, number four, Impressive Edge, third. I was a little disappointed by number one, Master Plan, the second choice at four to one, coming out of that third in the UAE Derby. He winds up fifth in the field of six. But following up the really nice win in the slop last time, timeline does it again in career start number three. Yeah, and I think what's most impressive about this to his connections are he had to make a couple of different moves in the race. I don't know that he was handling the track that great early on, uh, and he also had the uh, impressive edge trying to keep him boxed in a little bit down the backside, but he got his way out. He was stalking the pace, and, and it, I, again, I don't know that he was as smooth on this sloppy track as he was in the aqueduct mud. Uh, interesting when Jose Ortiz on uh, meantime wanted to sort of float him out, thinking that Javier would go outside of him. But Javier dove to the inside, smart move, and uh, instead of getting hung 12 wide, and he rallied up the rail, which, uh, you know, I don't know if that was, I guess the track was pretty fair, but I think early on it seemed like everyone was avoiding the inside, and at least the first three races. Uh, and then he uh, tried to box it, t tighten it up again on uh, the on, uh, timeline, but his, uh, that horse had none of it and just kept going. It was, it was a pretty nice performance for that horse, I thought, for a third career start, first at his big race. And, and did, uh, was any indication given as to what might be next? Yeah, they're not going to look at the Belmont Stakes. Uh, Chad, uh, and he, he said it after the race yesterday, and he reaffirmed it this morning. He's going to look to, to get to the Haskell, and one race that they might use to get there is the Pegasus, uh, which is it's not a glorious race, but it's a good way to get them around two turns. Mile 16th, I believe it's June 18th. I mentioned something like the Ohio Derby, which is a week later, which has a little bit more money behind it. But I, I think the means to an end is, is sort of the, pro, the, the thought process here, running the Pegasus and then have a race over the track, two turns for the Haskell on July 30th. All right, let's go over to the grass. A little bit later on the card was the Bogey for uh, the ladies. Grade 3 event, uh, $150,000 up for grabs, mile and a 16th. And again, uh, the Europeans with their experience over soft turf courses always have a little bit of an edge, and Hawksmoor gets it done here, having started the career in Europe. The last couple of starts prior to this were in the United States, but number three, Hawksmoor under Julian Le Perot just holds on over Decida, who hadn't been seen since Woodbine uh, last September. Uh, time in motion, nice Jimmy Toner horse that I like, third, Reina de Bateria, fourth. But again, nice little ding-dong battle won by Hawksmoor over to see to here late. Yeah, you might uh, should consider it fortunate that they could get a field like that for 150,000 grade three. Yeah. In essence, that was a grade one type of race, um, you know, even though this Temple City scratched out of it. Like you said, Hawksmoor, uh, the, I think the experience on, previous experience in Europe on soft ground helped her a lot. To I think there was a question mark going in on whether she would handle it. I thought she ran well, not her A performance, I don't think, which I believe she prefers firm ground uh, even more. But I think it served a purpose for Chad Brown to get that horse a start uh, this year. As you mentioned, hadn't been out since last fall. So that should set her up nicely for the New York Stakes. I believe that's the day before the Belmont uh, or the Thursday. They kind of moved it around on me. Uh, Hawksmore, I just got off the phone with Arnold Delacour about 20 minutes before you guys called. And uh, he's looking at maybe running back in just a game. Uh, he thinks okay. the player is pretty versatile in terms of distance. So. I think he's going to look at the great, take a shot in the grade one, uh, just the game on Del Monte. All right, Dave. We're going to take, uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, we had to swap the turf courses for the stakes races. We ended up getting the Man of War on a yielding turf course, and uh, the mare was heck to pay. She was awesome. Uh, she was very good, Zakova. Uh, she, she dominated this this, uh, this field. You know, this was really probably more of like a grade three. Type of race. I think we had it mixed up yesterday. The grade three was the grade one, and the grade one was the grade three. And I, I don't, you know, I, I'm not going to buy those fractions. Yeah, that. good they for you. Make, they, don't, <laughs> they don't make any sense to me. Um, I could, you know, you know, like I tweeted yesterday, I thought Wiggle a Jiggle could be competitive in a field like this if they go that <laughs> slow. Um, I don't know if it's. I don't know if it's a timing issue. I don't know if it's a gate placement issue. I don't know if it's a measurement, accurate measurement issue. I don't know what it is, but I, I know that they couldn't possibly, these types of horses could go three quarters. They don't go three quarters and 124 in a morning gallop. So, uh, But 
it, that set aside, the Comba really relished the, the ground. She stalked the pace. When Johnny asked her the, the question, she just kind of, you know, drew away from him. And Johnny, I did talk to Johnny afterwards, and he said that, you know, they were, he was told by the connections that, you know, even when she gets to the front, just keep riding her because she's the kind that can pull herself up when she gets the lead. So he said, even though, you know, she's drawing away, winning by four or five, he was, he was just following instructions to keep riding her out through the wire. And that was a, it was a solid performance from a, from a mayor against the boys, no question. Well, I'll say this, the, you know, a buyer speed figure on the turf of 110, which I, I think is what I've read on Twitter that she got. Yeah, that it's it's already been adjusted to a 107. Okay. That's a bad sign. <laughs> I mean, visually, you got to throw out the teletimer, etc. And then, uh, following up her victory in the Distaff Highway Star in the Ruffian at a mile. Yeah, you know, this Philly always gets overlooked. Five to yes. one. Uh, I thought she, I thought Oracle would be favored because of her affinity for a wet track. But I, I did, uh, you know, I thought Highway Star was definitely going to be competitive in here and I actually wasn't sure if she was going to run because it seemed like they wanted this was the opportunity to gold her uh, uh, her graded stakes victory but she she held her off highway start held bar of gold off and now uh, nice nice finish for the Bromans one two finish um, and you know Chester's quite happy. He, he didn't seem upset that Bar Gold didn't get the greatest stake. He just seemed happy that Highway Star got another one. And I think she's going to take a big swing for the next one. Go for the grade one in the fifth. So might as well. Might as well. She's undefeated. Nothing to lose. She's undefeated around one turn. Uh, I believe she's undefeated at Belmont. Uh, you, might as well, you might as well take the, the shot there uh, in the fifth. And if it doesn't work out, then there's always you know, other stakes later in the summer. But she's in raging form right now, so go on with it. Nice New York bread. Again, it's not your uh, father's New York bread program no. anymore. Speaking of which, have you heard any update uh, where they might aim, might aim with Twisted Tom? Uh, I don't. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what they're going to do with that horse, if they're going to look at a, 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 a route stake somewhere else or you know, or maybe even cut him back for a race like the Mike Lee. I'm, uh, I'm not sure where they're headed with it. And again, for folks who aren't familiar, winner of the Tessio, uh, but a New York bread, so there are plenty of uh, options out there. Dave, before we let you go, just want to get an update from you. Uh, it was, what, a week and a half, maybe two weeks ago, Naira announced really kind of a major change at Aqueduct, certainly a major change in the winter as the inner track will be disappearing and beginning a, a green makeover, as it were, and the main track will essentially be winterized. Talk a little bit about those changes. Yeah, going back, uh, going back in time uh, to like the '70s, where the Aqueduct had two turf courses, and there was one dirt track at Belma at Aqueduct, and the, the inner track is already out. A new turf course is being laid down, uh, and the outer track will be used for their whole racing program. Um, I know people are like, "Oh, does this mean Belmont's going away?" No, it doesn't mean Belmont's going away. It just means that there might be some renovations down the road at Belmont Park that would require some time away from Belmont, particularly in the fall. I, I felt like the Belmont State is moving anytime soon or at all. Um, I think you could see a scenario where in 2018 that maybe a Belmont fall meet is, is being conducted at Aqueduct. And, and if you do something like that, you can't do it on one turf course, especially the way things are now. If you look at look at the way cart races are being carted in New York. The majority of races carted, not necessarily run, but carted are for the grass. And they need two turf courses to get it done. And that's really what, what's behind it. And uh, this just gets a jump start on that process. When we get to Aqueduct in November, you'll have two turf courses, uh, and I think the month of November, if the weather is good, you'll see a six to seven turf races again. <laughs> will, will that uh, new turf course be ready for the next Aqueduct meet? Yes, we don't get there till November. I believe it's if it isn't already laid down yet, it's in the process of being laid down. Uh, the, you know, Aqueduct is closed. Let's get a drone That's over it. <laughs> yeah, you know what's funny? I flew when I came back from Kentucky. I flew over. Uh, aqueduct to a degree. It was like outside, a little further away. I was trying to look outside my window when I came back from the Derby last Sunday, and I could see more green than brown, but I couldn't exactly you know, okay. look at great visual. But uh, yeah, it, it should be, you know, Aqueduct, like I said, its back stretch is closed, like they've done the past few years. Uh, right around May 1st, they move everybody either to Saratoga or Belmont, and so they can work on that, on that surface uh, without having to worry about interrupting any training that's going on on the dirt. And they, they claim it'll be ready by the time uh, Aqueduct opens for training, which is right after the Saratoga meet ends sometime uh, early September. Yeah, so, should, should, uh, 
it should be good to go. Yeah, it should be interesting. Uh, winter time, uh, obviously, the more traditional distance is not uh, limited anymore by that uh, inner track. So it'll be interesting to see how that affects field size and whatnot. Dave, just got a, a minute here, uh, but before we let you go, you were down in Kentucky last week covering the Derby. Is tell us you're going to be heading. Uh, later tonight perhaps down to uh, Pimlico to cover the Preakness, but just give us some quick impressions on the Derby. Uh, always dreaming, you know, uh, tremendous job by the team Fletcher there for getting that horse who seems to, I thought he was going to be a little bit too rambunctious in the morning, but they made that change to the draw reins, and you didn't know how we would react after five days of draw reins once they took him off, but he was fine. He was acting perfect in the walkover, perfect in the paddock, and he, he ran a very solid race, uh, obviously, to, to get the job done. Uh, the ones that are coming out of that race that might have a chance. You know, looking at Lee, I thought I had the, as good a trip as one could have, ever hope for from the rail. And you know, not good enough for my best. partner here who had him on top. Oh, oh, that's well. Uh, hope, hopefully, you had him across the board because that was a nice uh, thirty-three to one. That was a nice, that was a nice place and show payoffs as well. But uh, I don't know if he turns the tables. I don't know if it's Classic Empire or any one of these new guys. But I, I think there's a very good chance that we could be looking at uh, a potential Triple Crown attempt. Uh, in, uh, was it now four weeks? And given the connections, the place will be rocking if that happens. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, though, uh, where do the where do the challengers come from? Because you know, you know, Todd, I don't think Todd's going to be running anything against them. Yeah, uh, you know, he's got <laughs> three or four in there. If Todd wins the Preakness, I think he runs one in the Belmont. If he loses the Preakness, he could have three or four in the Belmont. Yeah. That's what's so weird. That's it. All right, Dave. I just want to know if you have the hat concession. The hat concession. Yes, did you post a picture on Twitter, the hat you wore opening day, the inner dirt track? Oh, yeah, well, that was given out by Glenn Mathis way back in the day. He oh, boy. Pass, I don't know, two dozen of them. It, was, it wasn't a giveaway. It was just something that Glenn Mathis did. Okay. The communications director, and there's only two of us left that I, <laughs> that I know have them, uh, Danny Kay from Equibase and, and myself. And wow. Just, I, don't, I don't know what I'm doing. It was the symbol, to, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's the, it's the <laughs> basic symbol for the inner track. It's a blue hat with a white a square and a dot. The square and the dot is the inner track symbol, which we, which we will not I, you know, <laughs> Well, Dave, I'll tell you. Dave, I know, I know you know now, about yeah. how old I am, but I remember when there was no inner dirt track. Well, that's older than me. That's when, you get, that's when you're <laughs> old. Thank you, Dave. Travel Dave, yeah, safely. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, get down to Pimlico safely. We'll check out your work on uh, DRF.com. Anytime, guys. Thank you. Dave Brennick from now, the Daily Racing Forum. I don't and I, I wouldn't say it was on the air, but, but with Dave Grenning and, and Mark Henning, that is like the Tappet and Uncle Mo. They, they battle it out in the pedigree barn. Twitter, Twitter with wise, the helpfulness yeah. of Mark Henning and Dave Grenning. It would be embarrassing to say it when he's on the phone, but I wanted to get that in. Yeah, he does a, a great job. All right, let's, hit, let's get to the end of the show with a couple of topics that are just kind of quick hitter type of things. I mentioned it on the Handicappers Report yesterday. You brought it up, but I said, hey, let's show the video. That freakish uh, Friday race at uh, Golden Gate. And I didn't realize it. If you watch the pan shot, you, you don't even see it. And the announcer doesn't mention no. it. And I, when I first saw the video, this is what I saw. Hello. This is the head-on shot. They're on the, they are on the far turn, not the clubhouse turn. And it's a track employee who is working on the timing system. And he didn't realize it was a turf race. And they, they just miss him there. If the guys can rack How it up again. How about he's standing up folks, and he sits down? He stands up. And, and, and it's not because the horses are coming. He I wasn't sure. To, what, was he, was yes. he kind of kneeling down to work? Why? And you see it? Well, it's too late. Yeah. He already missed it. He was already. But boy, I mean, does he get lucky? Does the track get lucky? And I pulled up the chart to see what they say. The chart says uh, such and such and such. Three wide, then had to check away from the obstacle at the corner. Well, the obstacle. Well, I thought, tell Mar oh, they that's... called it debris when they had this stuff. <laughs> now thought, we have it all. But you get a little further in the chart. Uh, the four path that had to steady away from the man kneeling on the course. But this was interesting. Here's the chart caller, the last line. The stewards conducted an inquiry into the incident. And said. In involving an employee of the racetrack on the turf course during the running of the race, but failed to alter the results. I think the use of the word failed kind of uh, gives, puts a little subjectiveness. The of the, the, there's a little subjectiveness into that. And here's the unfortunate thing, Seth, and I don't know that it happened. I've been busy this day. That's often what's made Sports Center in our sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, Not Arrogate's victory yeah. in the World Cup, 
but freakish kind of yeah uh, but boy uh, things were kind of lucky out there it very was just friday at golden gate um and also wanted to just tip our cap because yesterday opening day at monmouth uh boy the weather didn't cooperate <laughs> but i guess they had a pretty good crowd there and they're they expecting a good crowd for mother's day but in the feature yesterday uh the winner was rainbow hill um the winner was trevor mccarthy career win number two 1,000 for the 22-year-old. Um, and it, well, We've been talking about yes. him almost since the beginning of the Absolutely. career. Absolutely. Um, pretty much down in Maryland is where he plies his trade, but came up for the stakes race yesterday. Just a guy the who kept showing up in the Excel spreadsheet for yeah. me. I'm like, what so is this? Congratulations to uh, Trevor, again, reaching the milestone very, very early in the career. All right, we'll wrap things up for this edition of and they're off i forget do we thank uh woodbine i think we do thank woodbine here uh, if i'm not mistaken wouldn't Wood, hurt woodbine yeah we'll just even if we don't we'll give them an extra uh, shout woodbine pick bet and cheer on great racing north of the border thanks to them for uh, their sponsorship all right you got anything else to toss in happy mother's day denise yeah very good yeah happy mother's day to all the moms out there we're in here uh, every sunday morning from 10 until 11 a.m or thereabouts we'll wrap things up for this week enjoy the racing this afternoon we'll see you again next time You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off-Track Betting.